The world following the end of the Second World War had seen huge technological advances along with the rise of two superpowers that would define world history for over 40 years. Even prior to the end of the Second World War, humanity had developed first-generation jet aircraft, world-ending weapons in the form of atomic bombs, and many others. One of the advancements that had resulted from the war was that of armored warfare, which had seen the rise and fall of heavy tanks as viable weapons and the emergence of the medium tank as the optimal vehicle for the battlefields of both the Pacific and Europe. This concept of a fast, decently armored and armed vehicle that could act as a spearhead for an army had proved its worth in the armies of the Allied powers. While Germany was forced to develop heavier and heavier vehicles for defensive usage, nations like the Soviet Union were mass-producing tanks that could outnumber and outspeed their German counterparts without the need for heavy armor and heavy guns. The idea of the main battle tank arose out of this, calling for a tank that could carry a heavy gun while also fulfilling every necessary role on the battlefield. Having a gun that is able to defeat enemy armor, having armor capable of sustaining fire, and most of all having the mobility to advance alongside or ahead of a moving army. Vehicles such as the British Centurion, the Soviet T-54, and the American M-48 are some of the most well-known examples of early MBTs. Today, with the help of our sponsor Armored Warfare, we'll be taking a look at one of these projects, namely the T-64. Over a century ago, the first tanks entered combat in the Battle of the Somme. Since then, hundreds of designs have seen use in every conflict, from small local battles to the largest wars. Some of these are destined for failure, cursed by their own design. Those that succeed went on to shape warfare in ways no one could have imagined. Prepare to dive into the complex stories of tank development as we peel back the pages of history on some of the world's most iconic designs. Through ingenuity, sweat and blood, these machines have been forged for battle. Huge thanks to Armored Warfare for sponsoring this video and the entire Forge for Battle series so far. Armored Warfare is a free-to-play online game built around armored vehicles from the early Cold War to the newest main battle tanks from around the world. Sign up for the game for free using my link in the description and you'll get an exclusive welcome pack just for my viewers. Inside you'll find 7 days of premium time and a free premium Type 59 2A. Pause the video right now and get the download started so you can join my in-game clan, the Cult of Cone. Once you've done that, come right back and we'll get right into the video. The development of the British 105mm L7 rifled cannon had changed the nature of tank design for Western powers, delivering a gun capable of defeating Soviet armor from a significant distance using the most modern rounds available. The lightweight nature of the gun gave it a versatility that would allow tank designers to move towards lighter tanks that would have great speed combined with great firepower at the expense of heavier armor. The most well-known MBT that displayed excellent speed and firepower was the German Leopard 1, which has seen service since 1965 in over 16 countries around the world. However, one of the most recognizable and widespread MBTs would be the American M60, which has been in service since 1959 with over 27 countries in a multitude of conflicts. The M60 would be the mainstay MBT for the United States, armed with the deadly L7 known as the M68 and had respectable armor. With advancements in anti-tank weaponry and armored vehicles such as the Leopard, M60, and Centurion, it is logical that one would see NATO as being the leading force in the world in terms of armored warfare. However, what if I was to tell you that this was not always the case? By the mid-1950s, the Soviet Union had already started to realize the drawbacks of their current MBTs, the T-54 and T-55. While its 100mm gun had been an effective weapon, it was beginning to have trouble with the armor of the newest NATO vehicles such as the Centurion and M48. This resulted in the Soviets starting to experiment with higher velocity shells, which resulted in the 115mm U5TS smoothbore cannon, the first smoothbore tank gun. It was found that the T-55 itself was unable to mount the gun, and as such, a larger turret and hull were made, resulting in the T-62. While the armor of the T-62 was essentially the same as the T-55, the gun was arguably the most advanced when it was deployed in 1961. While the T-62 on its own is an example of the flip-flop of technological advancements that would be seen throughout the Cold War, this video is focused on the tank that can be said to have caused an even more significant advancement for the Soviet Union over NATO. 
The T-64 was the brainchild of the designer of the T-54, Alexander Morozov, who started to design a vehicle known as the NST, or New Medium Tank, in the 1950s. This original vehicle was first envisioned as a medium tank similar to the T-54 but with significantly better armor and firepower. This development would see the first prototypes being produced in 1958 known as Object 430. Already, what would become the T-64 was showing radical differences from the T-54-55. Object 430 was armed with the new D-54TS cannon, 120mm of frontal armor, and a different engine in the form of a compact, opposed piston design. Object 430U, a further development, was different in that it was armed with a 122mm gun and had 160mm of angled frontal armor, which made it essentially a heavy tank but on a medium tank chassis. The Object 430 and 430U did not proceed further as they were not enough of an improvement over the already widely used T-55. The true predecessor to the T-64 that we know is the Object 432, whose development started just after the Object 430U. This tank would see many technological advancements, which started with the usage of the new 115mm gun of the T-62. While the 115mm was a change in design, an even more radical design element within the Object 432 was the incorporation of an automatic loader for the gun. This autoloader was beneficial as it allowed the tank to be smaller, lighter, and have less crew necessary to operate the vehicle compared to the T-55 and T-62. However, the gun and the autoloader were not what made the Object 432 and the T-64 the most technologically advanced tanks in the world. That would be the armor. Unlike the T-62 that changed the game with the first smoothbore cannon equipped to a tank, the T-64 changed it even further with the second application of composite armor on a tank. The composite armor used on the Object 432 was known as Combination K and according to Steven Zaloga was designed to survive heat as well as tactical nuclear weapons. The first generation of Combination K consisted of a sandwich design in which a layer of steel surrounded two layers of reinforced plastic and ceramic plates. There was also attempts to use ceramic balls within the armor but this was abandoned due to the balls not being able to retain their shape well. This composite armor was reportedly capable of withstanding the heat shells of the L7, giving the tank the equivalent armor of 410mm against APFSDS and 450mm against heat. This armor allowed the tank to retain its smaller stature but increase the weight to 34 tons. The Object 432 was approved for production which started in 1963. In December of 1966, the tank was deployed in the Soviet Army and redesignated as the T-64. The paint was barely dry on the new MBTs before the designers sought to improve the tank. Not many of the 115mm equipped T-64s were built before the 125mm D81T was ordered to be fitted to the tank. The new gun required a new autoloader due to the larger size of the ammunition. This tank, designated the Object 434, was also equipped with night vision and fiberglass to replace the aluminum that was previously used in the armor. The 434 was tested between 1966 and 1967 and was officially accepted into the Soviet Army in 1967 as the T-64A. The T-64A was assigned to elite units that formerly operated the IS-3 and T-10, essentially replacing the last operational heavy tanks in active service in the Soviet Army. T-64s that were built prior to the T-64A were modernized to the A standard and named the T-64R between 1977 and 1981. The T-64A was first received by the 14th Guards Motor Rifle Division in East Germany, and this deployment was the first time that NATO became aware of the vehicle's existence, according to multiple sources. The T-64A would remain in service for quite some time, but it would eventually be upgraded to the T-64B. The T-64B is the most produced variant of the T-64, being the basis of nearly every variant of the tank after this upgrade. As with how the T-64A started, the B began with the study into how to improve the vehicle, resulting in the Object 476 and 447. The 476 had a different 1000 horsepower engine, while the 447 had a new fire control system that combined a laser rangefinder with the ability to fire missiles from the gun. The 447 won the competition and was ordered for production as the T-64B in two variants, one with the capability of launching missiles, T-64B, and one without the equipment to launch a missile, T-64B-1. These two variants entered service in 1976 and were given upgrades for their guns, stabilizers, and smoke launchers in 1981. 
When developed and deployed, the T-64 was arguably the most advanced tank in the world. It combined both advancements in armor with superior firepower in the form of its 125mm gun. The inclusion of the autoloader in a basket formation at the bottom of the fighting compartment meant that it could hold more ammunition, 28 rounds, and even allow for APFSDS rounds to be longer, improving their penetration. The tank was more mobile than the T-72, which gave it significant value in strategic planning. It was also easier to drive due to the assisted controls and better suspension. It boasted exceptional armor protection that was capable of withstanding the most commonly fielded anti-tank round by NATO, 105mm heat FS, and penetrate the armor of every NATO tank with its exceptional 125mm main gun. At the time of deployment of the T-64A in 1967, the United States fielded its M60 Patton while the United Kingdom, France, and West Germany had just started fielding their newest main battle tanks. These included the Chieftain, the AMX-30, and the Leopard 1, respectively. Studies were conducted on captured vehicles that found that the Chieftain Mark V and the M60A1 were incapable of surviving fire from the T-64. The Chieftain was able to be penetrated by the 125mm APFSDS from over 3,000 meters, and the M60A1 performed similarly. This meant that essentially no NATO tank at the time of deployment of the T-64 was able to compete effectively. In addition, there are not many reports available that detail the ability of Western tanks in defeating the T-64 near the time of NATO's learning of the tank's existence. However, there were positives that were present in NATO tanks that gave them a chance, primarily their rate of fire, speed, and the doctrines of their native armies. On a realistic battlefield, the T-64 would have a strong upper hand, but Western tanks had a good chance of competing due to their effective weaponry combined with their speed, specifically the Leopard 1 and AMX-30. The T-64 certainly had many positives towards its design, but this does not mean that it did not have its own share of problems. One of the main problems is that the gun utilized two-piece ammunition as compared to NATO's one-piece ammunition, with Britain being the exception. Although the autoloader was fast, restocking the ammo is very slow, and the presence of charges presents a danger of cook-off if the tank is penetrated. In fact, the danger of ammo cook-off is worse in the T-64 than in the later T-72 due to the size of the placement of charges vertically rather than horizontally. The autoloader itself was a hazard to crew members as there were no safety features present in early versions of the mechanism. It was actually possible to get a limb caught in the mechanism and cause a crew member to be dragged into the autoloader upon firing. If the autoloader were to break in battle, then it is extremely difficult to manually load the gun. It's been reported that the rate of fire could drop to one round per minute due to the turret being too cramped to effectively reload the gun. In terms of the protection of the tank, while its composite armor was excellent, its side armor was not as stellar. It only had 85mm of side armor, which was made even more vulnerable due to the small road wheels on the tank. Even worse is that the ammunition was in such a location that it was not able to enjoy protection from either the wheels or the side skirts of the tank. While the engine of the vehicle was indeed an impressively powerful machine, it suffered from repeated malfunctions and fires. This was so bad, in fact, that even just starting the engine could result in a fire. Finally, the tank suffered from problems not commonly found within NATO tanks, the lack of a fourth crew member. Generally, this crew member would be available if someone were to be hit, such as a driver or gunner. However, in the T-64, this was more difficult as there were only three people present. In addition, maintenance of the tank would be more difficult due to the daily work requiring more effort on three individuals rather than four. The T-64 was one of the most technologically advanced tanks in the Cold War, bringing significant innovations to the table that completely outclassed many of its Western contemporaries at the time. Its armor was completely immune to the most common heat FS used at the time by the West, while its gun was capable of defeating even the heaviest armor from immense distance. While not being the most widely produced Soviet tank, over 13,000 had been built. T-64s primarily were deployed in Eastern Europe and was unique in that it was one of the only tanks developed by the Soviets that was never exported until its replacement arrived. Through its lifetime, the T-64 has seen a significant amount of modernization and upgrades and has been the basis of many designs later on. One of the most significant is the T-80, which is a direct variant of the T-64 with the incorporation of a gas turbine engine. The T-64 remains in service with three nations, and also with three internationally unrecognized states. Despite its lower numbers of production and deployment, the T-64 proved its worth with its significant technological innovations that made it more advanced than even the T-72 that came after it. 
The tank gave the Soviets an advantage in armor and firepower that could only be beaten by NATO in the late 70s with the development of tanks such as the Leopard 2, M1 Abrams, and Challenger 1. Due to its effect on NATO tank development, it can be said that the T-64's legacy remains to this day. This concludes the story of the T-64's development. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this in the future. A huge thanks to Armored Warfare for sponsoring this video and to Lord Captain Teapot for working on the script. In part 2 of this video, we'll be taking a look at some of the later variants of the T-64 as well as the combat history of it. So if that sounds interesting to you, be sure to ring that bell so you don't miss it when it drops. If you'd like to help further support future content from me, I encourage you to check out my new website, Konovark TV. All my videos will be posted over there as well, so if the day ever comes that YouTube decides talking about tanks is no longer advertiser friendly, you can still get your fix of both this series and Cursed by Design. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.